now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Faber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Contrary to what people think, the Star Wars franchise wasn't the first one to have prequels. The Third Man motion picture was, in fact, the first prequel. Because before that, you ha- or after that, I should say, you had Orson Welles in the lives of Harry Lyme, who was the Third Man. And that radio series, you will hear uh, an episode of which next, episode 42, uh, this episode entitled The Elusive Vermeer. Originally broadcast May 16th, 1952. Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. of Harry Lyme, the fabulous stories of the immortal character, originally created in the story The Third Man, with zither music by Anton Karras. Have you ever tried looking for a needle in a haystack? Well, I did a bit of needle searching in London myself not so long ago, only this was no ordinary needle. As it all concerned a picture a man had painted in Holland 300 years ago, I'll call this little adventure The Elusive Vermeer. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man, in today's story, The Elusive Vermeer. I first met Horace St. John Windermere. Oh, yes, that really was his name, at Cannes. Horace had class. He was probably the classiest breaking and entering merchant that had ever burgled an English country mansion. And he had taste. Too. Horace's jobs were all big ones, and he planned them months in advance, down to the last detail. That's how I came to get involved. We were having a drink at his villa one evening, just the two of us. Hey, my dear fellow, I've been wondering if I could interest you in a small business proposition. Well, so long as it involves a maximum of profit with a minimum of risk, the answer is yes. Well, it'll be profitable enough, I assure you. As for the risk, well, that's up to yourself. I'm all ears. Now, with a certain <laughs> reluctance, I confess, I shall be returning to England next week. As soon as the right opportunity presents itself, I propose to visit a place called Bardsley Hall, Wilts. Wilts? Oh, Wiltshire, my dear fellow, the county. Bardsley Hall is one of the show places there, and the country seat of Lord Rexton. This visit will be during his lordship's absence, of course. Oh, naturally. Mm. It would be most embarrassing if we were to meet. Yes, he has several so. Hepplewhite and Adam pieces that I find quite irresistible. Not to mention a modest collection of Chelsea and Beau porcelain, some fine examples of Waterford glass, and, uh, well, this is where you come in, Harry. Oh? An extraordinarily fine painting by the 17th century Dutch master, Vermeer van Delft. Uh, no doubt you're on familiar terms with Vermeer's Lady of the Virginals in our National Gallery. Oh, I've been on familiar terms with many ladies, but I can't say I remember her in particular. <laughs> However, carry on, old man. Don't let me stop the fine flow of your eloquence. Well, I need hardly tell you that the disposal of the objet that came into my possession presents almost as many problems as their acquisition, and needs to be as carefully planned. Yes, I guess that's so well. Uh, fortunately, the Hepplewhite and Adam, the Chelsea and Bow, and the Waterford present no great difficulties. My clientele includes a number of gentlemen who are always eager to add to their collections at a reasonable price. Mm. However, the Vermeer is, as one might say, a rather different kettle of fish. Oh, how's that? Well, for one thing, it's rather too easily recognizable for an English collector to dare hang without risking the danger of having to answer awkward questions. Oh. And for another, the present-day price of a Vermeer is, I'm afraid, rather beyond the purse of most of my impoverished fellow countrymen. Oh, I see. It occurs to me, Harry, that with a little preliminary organization, you might possibly be able to find a market for it in America. Well, I do have a few connections back home. Precisely. So, if you're interested... Uh, Tell me, old man, what would be a fair price uh, for a Vermeer? In your currency, oh, $100,000? Mm, uh, oh, that's real money. And my cut of this $100,000 would be, uh, what, old man? Well, the normal agent's fee in transactions involving rare works of art varies from 20 to 33%. 
In that case, I'll settle for 50. I had proposed to suggest 40. I shouldn't if I were you, old man. That is, of course, if you really want me in on this deal. Very well, 50 it is. You'll start things moving from your end at once, sure, of course. Sure, sure, and you? Oh, I shall, as I say, forgo the pleasures of this idyllic spot and return to London next week. I shall make the requisite inquiries regarding his lordship's movements, and when the appropriate moment arrives, you will receive a wire from me saying simply, Roger. Roger. And then? Well, as soon as possible, you will go to Nice and catch the first available plane for London. By the time you arrive, the Vermeer will be in my possession. You will collect it at this address. Uh, I'll write it down for you, shall I? Yeah. Well, me. There you are. One, two, A, Allgate Grove, E, C, three. That'd be ah. somewhere in the East End, wouldn't it? Exactly. Not the most salubrious neighbourhood, I must admit, but one that I find extremely convenient at times. Selling old masters is not exactly, as the English would say, my cup of tea. But they don't call me Harry Resourceful Lime for nothing. As it turned out, I didn't even have to contact my American connections at all. A couple of days after Horace left for England, I got talking to a guy named Joseph J. Hopman, who turned out to be an oil millionaire from Omaha and who was traveling to give himself a bit of culture. All I had to do was mention the name Vermeer, and nature did the rest. Do I understand you to say, Mr. Lyme, that you've got a real, genuine, dyed-in-the-wool Vermeer for sale? Mm, well, I haven't quite got it yet, but... Uh, uh, but you can get it? I think so, yes. Right. Name your price. Well, they don't come cheap, you know. A uh, hundred and... Uh, and what? Well, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Sold? When can I take delivery? Well, not so fast, Mr. Huffman. You're, you're not buying a pair of socks in a five and ten cent store, you know. Well, I don't quite get you. Well, we've agreed on a price, certainly, but this may take a lot of delicate negotiation. You realize, of course, there are certain uh, unusual features about it. Uh, how do you mean? Well, for instance, the fixture's likely to be, shall we say, a trifle warm. I don't care if it's white hot. My partner, Junior H. Oppenheimer Jr., got himself a Rembrandt last time he was over here, and my wife's millions has been green with envy ever since. So you get me that Vermeer, Mr. Lyme, and I'll pay the price you name and ask no questions. Right. So, so long as you know exactly where we stand. I'm expecting word from my colleague in England any day now, and as soon as the OK comes through, I'll be flying to London. Now, I suggest you follow immediately, and when I have the picture, I'll deliver it to you. We'll close the deal. Fair enough? Sure. That's OK by me. <laughs> A few evenings later, Horace's wire came through. Roger. I passed the word on to Joseph J., and the following night I was in London. I decided I wouldn't mention the extra $50,000 to Horace. After all, what you don't know you're entitled to, you never miss. I booked in at the Ritz Aston. After dinner, I made my way out to the East End. Allgate Grove was a sinister little side street in the heart of a slum, and 12A wasn't exactly what you'd call a palace. However, I knocked, and after a while, the door opened a few inches, and a little cockney guy stuck his nose out. Yeah? What do you want, chum? Well, I'm looking for a Mr. Windermere. Well, he ain't here. Well, he told me to come to this address. Oh, he did, did he? What's your name? Harry Lyme. Oh, well, why didn't you say so at first? Come right in, Mr. Lyme. Thanks. You must be Jerry, aren't in you? In person. Well, we're getting to the parlor, shall we? All right. Not in fancy, but we can have a bit of natural air and private as much. Lead the way, old man. Lead the way. Just this door. All right. Make yourself at home, Mr. Lyme. Sit down and rest the old plates of meat. Thanks. Uh, when will I be able to see Mr. Windermere? Hmm? You mean to say you ain't heard about him yet? Why, no. Is something the matter? Something's the matter, all right. He's gone and rather well snuffed it. Snuffed it? Turn up his toes. Kick the person back. You mean he's dead? Well, ain't that what I'm trying to tell you? But how did it happen? Oh, it was the old butcher's block. What? Always been a bit dicky, you know. Just suddenly gave out. Butcher's me. block? Clock. Dicker, oh. Oh, you mean he had a heart attack? I couldn't put him much plainer, could I? Well, why did this happen? So yesterday I had a telegram from him. Well, that's when it happened yesterday. Oh. Last night, to be exact. It was all sort of a sudden, as you might say. See, Mr. Windermere and me had gone out for a bit of a run in the country. To Bardsley Hall, yeah, Wilson. Yeah, that's hmm. right. Well, we picked up a few odds and ends there, see? A few bits of old furniture and china ornaments and, and so on, and pretty junky stuff. Uh, was there a me. picture among the things that you yeah, picked yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, a big one in a gold frame. Oh. Old as the hills, it looked. Some oh. bloke with fancy dress sitting in a room with, <laughs> with a big map on the wall and one of them round globe things. Well, the, you know, sort uh, of picture map you pick up and the globe, and yes. a few bob. That's yes, right. Sir. I don't think why the governor bothered with it. Honest, I can't. Anyway, we was coming home, see? Uh, with the stuff yeah, in with the... the stuff uh... in the back of the van. And off we go with Mr. Windermere cracking jokes and chatting and waiting ninety to the dozen and, and me only listening with half an ear, as you might say. Then all of a sudden, I realised he ain't talking no more. I'll take a quick butcher's... Uh, butcher's? What's butcher's? Look a look. Don't you understand English? Well, I'll take a look and... 
It is all huddled up in the Johnny Horner, in the court. Oh, yes, yes I see. Yeah. Well, I stopped the man to see what's wrong. He's as dead as a ruddy door now. Poor old Horace. Yeah. Now, uh... He was took away first thing this morning by the undertaker. Mm -hmm. He's to be buried tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be a real slap-up funeral, I can tell you. That's Nothing good. but the best for the governor. That's what uh, I say. Yes, Adam, do you credit, sir. Uh, by the way, what happened to the picture? Picture? Uh, yes. Oh, you mean a picture? Yes, the picture. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I was a bit worried about that. So was I, as a matter of fact. Well, well, what with all them Rogers snooping around and so on, it might have been a bit dangerous. So, so I thought I'd better get rid of it too sweet. You don't mean to... Jerry, you didn't destroy it. Well, I was going to, and, and then I thought I could probably flog it for half a quid. Well, half a quid's half a quid in these hard times with super tax and all, so, so I took it to a bloke named Angus McFarlane, what has a junk shop down the street. Hey, Bob, that's all he'd give me. You mean you sold it? Yeah, hey, flipping ready, Bob. Well, where does this Mr. McFarlane have his shop? Oh, Turd Park Road, just up the high street. Well, is he, is he likely to be on the premises now? No, or... it's just a lock-up shop. I don't know where he lives. Why, what's the trouble? Well, I, I, I just thought I might buy it back if, uh, if he still has it. Well, I could think of a lot, lot of better things myself, but, well, if it's the picture you want, I'll find it at Angus McFarlane's. Okay, Jerry. Uh... But Jerry, it seems, had underestimated the business acumen of Mr. McFarlane. I was at his shop bright and early next morning, but when I mentioned the picture, he shook his head. Aye, sir, I mean the picture you mean, Oddie, but it's no longer here, the new. Well, who, who did you sell it to? A dealer from somewhere in Fulham. He was seeking for old frames, he said, and he bought all I had in the shop. Well, what was his name? Oh, I didn't ken that. He paid me cash, though. I didn't ask. You know whereabouts in Fulham he has his shop? I didn't ken that neither. Well, can you tell me anything about him at all that might help me to find him? Oh, I mean, he had an accent. Aye, he had an accent, all right. But as to whether it was a Welsh or what it was, I'd no like to commit myself. I'm afraid I've forgotten. Uh, would this five-pound note help you to remember, Mr. McFarlane? It'd be a great help. All right, let's start remembering. Well, as I recall the man, he was tall and thin and clean-shaped. Well, go on. What about his accent? Accent? Is there something about an accent? Okay. Here's another five. Now, give, Mr. McFarlane, give... Ah, why, of course. I had to call the new. He was Irish. Is that straight? Would you doubt the word of a McFarlane, sir? I'm telling you, he was Irish as Paddy's pigs. I was too late to do anything more that evening, so I went back to my hotel and spent the rest of the night cursing the perfidy of Mr. Angus McFarlane. Next morning, a waiter brought up my breakfast, and as I was coping with toast and English marmalade, I switched on the bedside radio. It was right in the middle of the morning news session. Cheese ration will be increased by one quarter ounce per person per week. The police last night recovered from premises in Reading a quantity of antique furniture, porcelain and glass, which had disappeared two nights previously from Bardsley Hall, Wiltshire, during the absence of the owner, Lord Rexton. A man has been detained. It is understood that a valuable painting by the Dutch master, Jan Vermeer van Delft, is still missing, and the police... Well, I didn't need anyone to tell me what that meant. I had to find that picture and find it fast, or else I might as well say a fond goodbye to Joseph J. Hoffman and his beautiful 150,000 bucks. <laughs> May 16th, 1952, The Lives of Harry Lime on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge, but it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate... For MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. 
The only actor credited on the lives of Harry Lyme was Orson Welles. All the other actors were stock players from England. This was all recorded, by the way, in London by Harry Allen Towers, not for the BBC, but for U.S. syndication. The Lives of Harry Lyme, May 16, 1952. <laughs> For half a day, I combed the main streets and back alleys of Fulham. By noon, I figured there couldn't possibly be another junk shop within two miles that I hadn't already been into. Then suddenly, in a dirty little side street, I found myself outside a dirty little shop, compared with which Mr. McFarland's dump looked like something out of Bond Street. What excited me was half a dozen soot-covered old pictures in the window. I pushed open the door and entered. At the top of the morning to you, sir. He was tall and thin and clean-shaven, and there was no mistaking that accent. Uh, do you happen to be the gentleman who bought a number of old pictures from a dealer in Allgate a uh, day or so ago? Oh, sure, that's me. From old Angus McFarlane, you mean? That's right. And you know Mr. McFarlane? Yes, have we been known each other these last 15 years? Wasn't it Patrick Bright himself, that's me, sir, that had the next stall to him in the old Caledonian market? Skip it, thank heaven I found you, Mr. Byrne. I'm trying to trace one of those pictures. It was sold to McFarlane by mistake. You mean to say it's a valuable picture? Well, not intrinsically so, but it belonged to my grandmother, and so for me, at any rate, it has a strong sentimental value, if you know what I mean. You <laughs> understand perfectly, sir. So if you still have it, I'll be glad to buy it back at a fair profit to yourself, of course. I have no idea. I've already sold one or two, but let's hope it's still here. Uh, come this way, sir. Yeah, this is the lot I was after buying from McFarland, the robber. Here they are. There were 15 or 20 pictures, most of them corneal reproductions like The Monarch of the Glen, Psyche at the Well, and The Cotter's Saturday Night. What originals there were looked to me even cornier still. I went through the lot three times. But there was nothing remotely like a Vermeer. You sure you are eight here, sir? Oh, well, that's quite sure. We searched the joint from floor to ceiling. He was right, of course. It simply wasn't there. You, you say you've sold one or two pictures? Yeah, that's right, sir. Well, who to? Do you know the names of the buyers? Well, he was a gent come in and bought one of them, sir. An arty sort of a gent with sandals and a big black beard. He was looking for a frame for one of his old masterpieces, he said. And then there was, uh, was Mrs. Huggett. Mrs. Huggett? Yeah, that's right, sir. Lives over the river at Putney. She was after buying a couple of pictures as presents for a married daughter, sir. Could this one I'm after possibly have been one of them? Sure, I don't know why not, sir. There was one I recall of some Highland cattle. Ugly beasts they were, too, but a fine picture. Uh, would that be it, sir? No, no, no. And the other, let me think now, sure, of course, I remember the other one was in an old-fashioned dress, standing in a room. With a map on the wall? Is that right, sir? There was a map. And a globe? You know, a globe of the world? Uh, sure, there was a globe, too, on it, sir, I remember it well. Is that the picture after all? I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Uh, uh, whereabouts in Putney does this Mrs. Huggett live? Well, sir, that's something I'm afraid I can't tell you. You don't know? No, sir, except she's somewhere up by the top of the hill, I believe. Okay, that's something to go on anyway. Uh, thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, this is for your trouble. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> no trouble at all, sir. Thank you, indeed. <laughs> Mrs. Huggett, Putney Hill. The scent was getting warmer. I hurried back to the main street looking for a cab to take me to Putney Bridge. And then, as I rounded a corner, I bumped into a man. A big, solid, very English-looking man. Why, hello, Mr. Lyme. Fancy bumping into you in Fulham, of all places. Oh, uh, hello. You don't remember me? I can't recall your face offhand, but your feet are familiar. I see what you mean. Yours would be flat, too, if you pounded a beat for ten years. Oh, of course. I remember now. Yes, Inspector James. That's right. <laughs> uh, Nice to have met you again, Inspector James. So long. What's the hurry, Mr. Lyme? I have a little business to attend to, Inspector James. I'm just... Uh... But we meet so rarely. In fact, I didn't even know you were back in England till yesterday. Uh, yesterday? Yes. I happened to notice you once or twice. You appeared to be doing a round of the junk shops. Oh, oh, that's yes. Well, you see, as a matter of fact... It's, Don't uh... tell me you're on the trail of the missing Vermeer, Mr. The Lyme. The missing Vermeer? Haven't you heard about it? It was stolen from Lord Rexton. Oh, no, I can't say I have. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to match an old Georgian decanter to make a pair for a friend of mine back home in the States. It... Any luck? No, not so far. I'm afraid things like that aren't as easy to come by these days. The antique market isn't what it was. 
It's all these rich Americans, you know. Mm, Sorry, yeah. no personal reflection. Uh, so I uh, no, you couldn't have met me when you said rich. Anyway, Mr. Lyme, if you intend continuing with your search, you might at the same time keep an eye open for this Vermeer. Our information is that it's found its way into a junk shop somewhere in this area. Oh, well, I'll certainly look for it, of course, but I'm no authority on painting. I wouldn't know a Vermeer if it crept up and bit me in the angle. You're far too modest, I'm sure. If, as I say, you do happen to find it by any remote chance, I'd be grateful if you'd get in touch with me at the yard. Oh, sure, sure. You can depend on that, Inspector. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Good day. Goodbye, Inspector James. Uh, hey, taxi! Taxi! <laughs> to get that picture and I had to get it fast and once I got it I'd have to get rid of it even quicker still well I found Mrs. Huggett after some trouble and I learned from her that she'd given them to her married daughter who lived at 216 Colchester Street Pimlico well I was hot on the scent now if I'd been a bloodhound I'd have barked or bayed or whatever it is they do anyway I found 216 Colchester Street with no very great trouble and from the way Marlena greeted me and showed me and I guessed mama had already been on the phone to some purpose well, the first thing I spotted when I walked into the parlor was the Vermeer. Yes, there it was in all its glory, hanging over the mantelpiece. It was all I could do to stop from shouting for joy. But if I imagined Marlena was going to be an easy nut to crack, I had another guess coming. It was obvious those telephone wires had been running red hot. May 16, 1952, The Lives of Harry Lyme on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Radio. Why should I advertise on radio? There's nothing to look at, no pictures. Listen, you can do things on radio you couldn't possibly do on TV. That'll be the day. All right, watch this. <clears throat> okay, people, and now when I give you the cue, I want the 700-foot mountain of whipped cream to roll into Lake Michigan, which has been drained and filled with hot chocolate. Then the Royal Canadian Air Force will fly overhead towing a 10-ton maraschino cherry, which will be dropped into the whipped cream to the cheering of 25,000 extras. All right, cue the mountain. You the Maraschino Cherry. Okay, 25,000 cheering extras. Now, you want to try that on television? Well... You see, radio is a very special medium because it stretches the imagination. Doesn't television stretch the imagination? Up to 27 inches, yes. She was born in a humble shack amidst the lemon groves of Goleta, California. Mommy, don't cry. You know what they say? When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I was going to say life sucks, and then you die. But I like yours better. And with that, Alexandra Johnson launched her lemonade stand. Lemonade, nickel a glass. Every day, even during the frigid California winters, a bone-chilling 72 degrees, you could find her. You can have a sour, you can have a treat. Little girl's lemonade will knock you off your feet. The little girl with the sour brew wanted more. National distribution franchises, and so she rolled out a well-budgeted advertising campaign. Me and the rest of the dock workers only drink little girl lemonade. She was made president of the International Sour Drink Association and chosen to give the keynote speech at their convention. You all sat with words of wisdom, honey? You know what they say, Mommy. Always advertise so consumers think of your product first? I was going to say never swallow a lemon seed or a watermelon on your tummy. This fabricated but interesting story is to remind you that it's called advertising and it works. Put your message on this national advertising platform by emailing classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Orson Welles and the Lives of Harry Lyme, the Third Man, May 16th, 1952. Well, I had to tell you your mother hasn't wasted your time sending you here, you know. I don't really know if I want to sell. Oh, but surely, um, Mrs. Smithers... Well, after um, all, there's William to consider. William? My husband. Well, I wouldn't like to do anything without consulting him. Well, I mean to say the picture's as much his as mine. Um, 15 pounds, hmm? Oh, I couldn't possibly dream of letting it go for that. William would be furious. I'm not good. Okay, 25. Come on, Mrs. Smith. 25 pounds. That's a, a lot of money for a picture like that. Look at it yourself. It's as old as the hills. Look, the way the paint's cracking and how the color's faded. It, it, it probably won't be fit for anything but a scrap heap in another couple of years, Mrs. You Smithers. seem keen enough to get old of it. Well, I uh, explained that to your mother. It has a sentimental value for me, Mrs. Smith. Well, so it has for me. How come? Well, you forget what's given to me. After all, a present's a present. It's not the sort of thing one should sell. 
Well, besides, it looks real nice up there over the mantel. Yeah. I should hate to see it go. Thirty pounds. Fifty. Fifty pounds for that old daub? Ridiculous. Well, take it and leave it. You drive a hard bargain, Mrs. Smithers, but okay. Here's your fifty. Oh, thanks very much, I'm sure. <laughs> I could hardly believe my good fortune. With a vermeer tucked under my arm, I hurried back to the Ritz Astor. All I had to do now was contact Joseph J., get rid of the picture, and collect my dollars, 150,000 of them, and every cent for Harry Lyme. I phoned Hoffman's Hotel, and to my delight and relief, I heard his voice at the other end. Joseph J. Hoffman speaking. Who is this? Hey, it's me, J.J., Harry Lyme. Well, say, how are you? It's swell to hear your voice. Ah, oh, you don't know how swell it is to hear yours. How's that little uh, business we discussed coming along? Well, that's why I'm calling you, to tell you I've, I've got the goods. No kidding. No kidding, right here. Fine. Bring it round to my hotel. No? Sure, right now. Do uh, you have the money, J.J.? Yes, sir, 150 grand. Boy, I can hardly wait to get my peepers on that picture. It won't be long, will you? Expect me in five minutes. <laughs> Hundred and fifty thousand dollars, enough to keep me in the luxury to which I've become accustomed for, well, for a month or two anyway. It seemed too easy. <laughs> As I came out of the Ritz Astor picture under my arm and the porter signaled a cab for me from the corner of my eye I caught sight of a familiar pair of feet coming towards me Inspector James of Scotland Yard I shot a quick glance the other side two more sets of feet just as big and just as flat also coming my way didn't have a chance in a million I knew it I did some split-second thinking Taxi, sir? Uh, yes, please. Where to, sir? Uh, Scotland Yard. Right. Did you say Scotland Yard, Mr. That's Lyme? right. Uh, why, hello, Inspector. Where did you spring from? And talk about coincidences. I was just on my way to see you, Inspector James. Really? Uh, why? You, you'd never believe it, but you know that picture you were talking about today, that, uh, veneer? Vermeer, Mr. Lyme. A oh, veneer oh. is a thin covering. Oh, uh, yes, a vermeer. Well, hold on to your hat, old man, but I... I think I found it. You do? Yes, I've got it right here. And you were on your way to deliver it to me. Yes, that's correct, Inspector Jess. Splendid. A most public-spirited action, oh, Mr. Lyon. Thank you. I'll take it now and save you the trouble, if you like. Certainly. Here you are. Thanks. I suppose it must be quite a relief to get rid of it. Oh, sure, yes. Probably. You know, of course, there'll be a reward for this from the insurance underwriters. Hmm. Uh, a, a reward? Oh, I didn't know that. Quite generous one, in fact. Five hundred pounds. Five hundred... Uh... How does that work out in dollars, Inspector James? Well, about fourteen hundred, I believe. But not as much as, say, a hundred and fifty thousand, of course. Still, quite a lot of money, eh? Uh, yes, quite a lot of money. And tax-free too. Tax-free. No wonder you're known at the yard as Lucky Harry Lime. Uh, no wonder. I would wonder as well. May 16th, 1952, The Lives of Harry Lime on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. It's a big, bold story set in the heartland of America, along the edge of Lonely Mountain. I am open for business. And so Big William Gorgon, played by handsome Michael James, fiercely set down his Midwest roots. Oh, darling, we're going to sell bathrobes and raise chickens. Set as adoring wife, Wilhelmina, portrayed by beautiful Glenda Olson. Oh, I love our store, Will. But they hadn't counted on Big Ralph's bathrobes and cattle store coming to town. Oh, Will, Will, what will we do, Will? Will had a plan, a way of facing off against tough Big Ralph. We're going to change the face of America. We're going to advertise. Ad for what? The print, broadcasting, and bus benches are going to tell people who we are and where we are. What's a bus? And so the story of how one man brought advertising to the heartland. Oh, Will, will it work? It will. Well, my name ain't Will, Wilhelmina. we got to advertise or we'll die. And so the greatest marketing story of all time is here. Advertise or die, dopey. Put your message on this national advertising platform. Email classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, part three of the five-part Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story, The Medium Well Done Matter. This originally broadcast April 16th, 1956.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Tony Ricardo. Oh, I've been hoping to get in touch with Did you. Did you receive my note? Was that your polite threat to kill me if I don't leave Carol Sharp alone? Yeah, I received it. And I have a sneaking suspicion the police department might be interested in No. Oh, please, I... I guess I acted a bit hastily. Perhaps you let me talk to you. You want to take the threat back? That still stands. Then you don't leave me much choice. Talk to me first. Believe me, you won't be sorry. But I might be dead. Is that it? I want to see you. Can't do it now, but where can I reach you? Sunrise 3, 9970. Okay. Meantime, don't get trigger happy. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Expense account item 7, 85 cents. Cab fare from the Bell Towers to the 18th Precinct Station and Sergeant Randy Singer. So, you met Carol Sharp, huh? Yep. I put on an act that would have done credit to the theater guild. <laughs> Told her she looked exactly like a girl I dreamed about as a kid, a girl named Carol. Oh, no. She swallowed it? Not only that, but she gave me a lecture on veridical dreams and allied psychic phenomena. <laughs> you deserve an Oscar. Also, she wants me to go with her and see this Madame Morgana Morgana. Oh, good. When? Tomorrow night. Well, you're not figuring on skipping tonight's seance, are you? Oh, no, not a bit. I want to find out what this stuff is all about, so I'll be prepared for tomorrow. Uh, this dame you have lined up pretty good? <laughs> She's got a big following. You ready to go? Oh, wait a minute. You said you had the file on Tony Ricardo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here it is, waiting for you. Yeah. Anthony Ricardo, alias Ricky Marino, alias Tony the Tip. There, here's his picture. Height 5'9, weight 172, eyes brown, hey, hair sparse gray, suspected member of the Dutchie Sperling outfit, 12 arrests, no conviction. Started as a rum runner back. Hmm? Hey, this is Tony Ricardo? It's the guy. Hmm, I would have sworn the man I talked to over the phone was in his 20s. Late 20s at most. You talked to him? After leaving an unpleasant little note under my door at the towers, he called me on the phone. Now, what kind of note? Oh, nothing particular. Just a gentle suggestion I lay off Carol Sharp. Threat, huh? Still got it? But I'm sure that voice couldn't have come from this old geezer. Yeah, well, frankly, I kind of wondered about the Sharp girl being interested in him. Even though the file does show he's always surrounded himself with a bunch of young ones, he... You know, he's probably handed out more mink coats. Oh, Johnny, you wait a minute. Uh, old Tony's got a couple of kids. Here, Angela. Goes under the name of Angela Richards. At least she used that name at Bryn Mawr. Bryn Mawr? Yeah, and Sarah Lawrence College at Bronxville. Yeah, the old boy tried to keep the stigma of his past away from her, I guess. Yeah, you see, uh, married to a doctor over in Hackensack. Respectable housewife. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the other... Anthony Jr., age 26. That was uh, last year. Let's see, that makes him 27. Now, Rutgers University, class... Hmm, not much on him. Unless I miss my guess, he's a chip off the old block. Now, you know where I can find him? All I have is his phone number. What is it? Wait till I see and talk to him. Uh, that may be too late. He's what I think he is. Why not ask this medium about him tonight? Yeah, that... Hey, come on, we're late. Let's go. Item 8, $1.20, cab to an old brownstone house somewhere over in the West 40s, way west, in a district that had seen better days. We were greeted at the door by a tall, gray-haired old gentleman, dressed in black, except for his white gloves, that somehow reminded me of a Paul Bearer. Come in, Mr. Singer and Mr. Dollar. Clarabel is about to begin. Psychometry is the mood this evening. Follow, please. How do you know our names? Oh, I had to give them to him when I made the appointment. Now, what's this uh, psychometry bit? You'll see. Oh, wow. The music gives me the creeps. Yeah, I... Th- Shh. Into the temple, please. And be seated. The temple turned out to be an old dining room. Bare wooden floor, heavy drapes over the windows. And as nearly as I could see, a bunch of chairs around in a circle filled with people. 
The sockets in the ancient chandelier that hung from the ceiling had red bulbs in them that barely glowed. We could hardly see a thing, although I'm sure the light went up very slightly when we made our entrance and then down again, as though somebody was controlling it with a rheostat. Our eyes were almost used to the semi-darkness by the time we seated ourselves in the circle. Nobody spoke, and the weird music from that scratchy record was beginning to get on my nerves or put me to sleep or something. I'm not quite sure what. Then, suddenly, there was a flash of light and a puff of smoke, and so help me... What the sand? Randy. Shh, quiet. This is all part of the act. Shh. Greetings. Greetings, Greetings. Greetings, friends of the unknown, friends of the mystics, of Botan the Indian boy, and the seventh son of the seventh son of Harry Shnoo the Mighty. And there she stood, in the center of the circle where the flash had gone off. Are we all in the mood? She stood there draped in what looked, even in the dim light, what looked like a slightly soiled bed sheet pulled in around her ample middle with a hunk of coarse rope. She wore a sort of turban, or maybe it was just an old dish towel wrapped around her head. A faint odor of gin pervaded the room. I guess her feet were bare, for she made no noise as she walked slowly around the circle holding on a shallow metal tray. Taking a collection so soon, I wondered? Each of you place upon the tray some object very close to you, something you have had a long, long Time that has become a part of you. Huh? Shh, you'll get it back. And if the spirits are with us, and there are no dissenting minds among us, if Botan, the Indian boy from the world beyond, is willing to act as our control, we shall learn many strange things this night. <laughs> Place something close to you upon the tray. Uh, will this watch me on? Shh, you must not speak. But keep the mood. Keep the mood. Are we all in the mood? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And now, dear friends, while I meditate and establish contact with the spirit world, Henningway will pass among you for the tiny assurance that you join us in all sincerity. <laughs> Now join hands to create the flux that will join our thoughts and minds and hearts and open the doors to enlightenment for all of us. Five dollars. Botan, are you with us tonight? Five dollars, please. Botan, will you answer Five us? Five dollars. Please. Are you with us now? Is that Botan that answers our call, or the little sister, Hyacinth? Ah, it is Botan. We may begin. I hold this ring. I feel the paramagnetic forces arising from it. This belongs to a businessman south of here. I seem to see clothing hanging in a large warehouse. Yes, yes. And the sound of many machines, sewing machines. Yes, yes, that's right. And many young girls working at the machines. One by one, she picked the objects off the tray, held them in her hand, and gave a kind of character reading of the owners. Occasionally, somebody in the circle would respond in a way that made it sound like she'd guessed right. Other times, she'd just make with a lot of generalities that could apply to anyone. Finally, she picked up my watch. This watch, I see tall buildings of stone and strange signs on them. I don't know what they mean. Tri-mutual universal adjustment. Huh? Randy. And I see great sheaves of papers carefully folded. And on each one it says, policy. Policy. I don't understand unless... Insurance, yes. This is fantastic. Wait till she gets the one I put there. The watch is from a young man. Clever, energetic. I will have many things to tell him at another time. But he must see me again. Often. And now, 
This other object that lay beneath the watch, I see a police badge. The cops! Oh, right. Dirty crooks, the cops are on to us. We're being raided. Yeah. Get them out of here. Get them away. 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 Get them Take your filthy hands off me. Let me out of here. You're not going anywhere until I have a talk with you. Anyway! Ditched me, ran out on me. I might have known he would at a pinch. There isn't going to be a pinch if you'll just shut up and stand still a minute. I wasn't doing no harm, honest officer, and, and all the money goes to charity. All right, all right. Settle down. Where's the light switch? Got it, Randy. I'll never live this down. Now look, officer. You look, Clarabelle. All we want is some answers to some questions. And you won't pinch me? Not if you tell the truth. Johnny? Yeah. Just how did you know so much about me? It certainly wasn't from holding that watch. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't. Though some there are who can do it that way. That I've heard. Well, go on. No pinch? No pinch. Well, when your friend called to arrange a being here tonight, Henningway, that bum, he would walk out on me. Go on, would you? Well, Henningway asked where you come from, so we'd know if the spirits was propitious there. That's what we always say. And I told him Hartford. That's right. So what's Hartford? Insurance. If a client's in insurance, he responds like you done. So I keep pushing it. And if he ain't, well, at least he thinks I done pretty good by describing the place he comes from. Yeah. What about the clothing maker right at the beginning? <laughs> Easy. He called from a hotel, so he calls the hotel back and gets his address. You told him he was from the south of here. Sure. Woodbine, New Jersey. Only business down there of any account is clothing and small farms. Well, where'd you find that at? State directory, any library. And anybody could see he was a businessman, not a farmer. Well, I'll be. And hooking him that way tonight, you could have had him coming back as long as he could afford it, huh? Sure. And if it hadn't been for you, you okay, double cross. Okay, okay. Now, what about the others? Some we get the dope on and some we guess at. But there's always enough good ones to keep going. So easy. And yet, I must confess she'd had me stop for a while... We talked with her a bit longer. Randy warned her to watch her step, and we left. Took a taxi back to my hotel. Well, did you learn anything? I should hope to tell you. What did the church-going spiritualists think of her kind? They hate him, and I don't blame him. Hmm. Are you still going to see Madame Morgana Morgana tomorrow night? Hmm, yeah. Well, mister, that one won't be so easy to expose. If you can expose her. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the medium well done appears. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From May 16th, 1956, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for making us a part of your day. If you enjoy these shows, you go to my webpage, classicradio.stream, where you can stream our shows on demand, learn more about classic radio collecting, and contact me, classicradio.stream. We also have a link to our friend Ted over at radiomemories.com, who provides a lot of the shows you hear here. RadioMemories.com. Ted can provide shows for you on cassette, on CD, or flash drive for your computer at a reasonable cost. Shows that sound really good. 
That's radiomemories.com. You can get his links over at my webpage as well, classicradio.stream. And uh, just a reminder, please thank this station, support their advertisers. Uh, It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Thank you so very, very much. And uh, we go to our webpage, classicradio.stream. You can find our other places we're available, like uh, Spotify, Spreaker, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Overcast. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.